I'm going to take you on a tour of possibly the most desolate wasteland, the most terrifying landscape and territory in the entire universe, the psychopath's mind. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignance of Love, Narcissism Revisited, and a professor of clinical psychology. And today we're going to tour the psychopath's inner recesses. How does he see you? How does he perceive of others? How does he conceive of human beings and of himself within this working model? It is not um, an easy question. It's difficult to answer. And it's difficult to answer because exactly like the narcissist, the psychopath lacks emotional empathy. He has cold empathy, combination of reflexive and cognitive empathy, but he lacks emotional empathy. Exactly like the narcissist, the psychopath has access to negative emotions, which are amplified tenfold over the narcissist. <laughs> when the psychopath is angry, he rages. When he rages, he is violent. So, psychopaths, in many respects, are exaggerated versions of regular, run-of-the-mill, normal so-called, healthy so-called human beings. But on the other hand, they lack the basic machinery of being human. They lack positive emotions. They lack empathy. And in the absence of positive emotions and empathy, how human can they be? It's another topic for today's lecture. So let's start with the basics. Now, the psychopath regards the world as a hostile jungle, a war, for, a war zone, a battlefield. Everyone is out to get him. Everyone is out to take him down. Everyone is a potential enemy. People are hiding knives and just waiting for the moment to stab him in the back. Betrayal is his daily bread. Now, when I say he's, in this case, he's justified <laughs> because the majority of psychopaths are men. Although the number of women diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, which is the clinical uh, term for psychopathy, the number of women is increasing, has been increasing dramatically since the 1980s. Still, the majority of men. And because the majority of men majority of men, perhaps it, has, it is a testosterone-laden view of the universe. Dog eat dog. Survival of the fittest. Um, if you don't fight, you die. So, this is how they see the world. And everyone in the world is a kind of military asset or a potential weapon. Psychopaths, in other words, in other words weaponize everything. While in other mental health disorders, people sexualize everything. The psychopath weaponizes everything, including, by the way, his sexuality. The psychopath regards other people as objects, the way you regard inanimate objects, your refrigerator, your smartphone, your television set, your laptop. The psychopath sees you the same way. Objects are immutable, they're responsive, they're functional. These are the three crucial elements in objects. They don't change. They're responsive to your needs and commands. You know, you use a remote control to change channels. And they're functional. They fulfill some function. Now, in cognitive development, we have something called object identity. It is the awareness that an object is the same even though it may undergo transformations. For example, take your coffee mug. Don't take my coffee mug. <laughs> take your coffee mug. Don't be psychopaths. Okay, take your coffee mug. The coffee mug remains the same object, despite differences in size, distance, color, lighting, orientation, how much coffee you pour in, how much coffee you have drunk, etc., etc., Shape, it's still a coffee mug. There is 
some essence of coffee magnes, and this is object identity. Psychopaths have an overdeveloped sense of object identity. In other words, they distill, they isolate, they extract, they extract the essence of people around them. And rather than refer to people around them as three-dimensional objects with a separate external existence, with needs and hopes and dreams and fears and priorities and so on and so forth, the psychopath relates exclusively to the extricated essence, to disquidity. So when the psychopath sees you, the psychopath analyzes you using cold empathy, the psychopath isolates your possible utility in which ways you could be of use to the psychopath, and this is your essence. From that moment on, the psychopath would inter uh, interact and refer to your essence. The rest, the rest of you, is of no interest to the psychopath. So, psychopaths reduce people to functions. They dehumanize them, they functionalize them. And from that moment on, they regard them as immutable, unchangeable, fixed, frozen in time. In other words, psychopathy involves object fixation, or perhaps more precisely, object identity fixation, where they are incapable of perceiving changes in people, the subtle transmutations that people undergo on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. They're incapable, psychopaths are incapable of interacting with the multifarious facets, the kaleidoscopic nature of people. They reduce them to point-like entities and they continue to interact with these entities. Now, this is not the same as snapshotting or introjection in narcissists. It's the narcissist snapshots you and introjects you in your totality. The narcissist, when, he, when the narcissist creates an introject of you, the introject contains all the information about you. It is true that the introject is incapable of change, but the introject is complete. And in the narcissist's case, the introject can be somehow modified. For example, the, the narcissist can idealize the introject and then devalue the introject. With a psychopath, that's not the case. There is a, there is a pinpointed reduction of you to a single sentence or a single statement, and all the interactions are with this statement, and this statement never changes, or if it does change, uh, it is erased and a new statement takes its place, as we will see momentarily. And I call it object identity fixation. The process of object learning in psychopathy, making a connection or an association between one aspect of an object and another, is disrupted. Object learning in psychopathy is disrupted. I'll give you an example of object learning. You have a cucumber. A cucumber is long and a cucumber is green. <laughs> that is object learning. You associate the two qualities of a cu cucumber, and these two qualities put together give rise to the cucumberness of the cucumber. The psychopath is incapable of doing this with people. In other words, the psychopath's view of people is very infantile and is essentially based on some elaborate modification or elaborate rendition of splitting. The psychopath reduces you to an all-good object, in other words, an all-useful object, an object that can further the psychopath's goals, allow the psychopath to accomplish things, and to experience the gratification of goal orientation. So then you're all good, and you're all bad, if you stand in the way of the psychopath, if you're an obstacle, a hindrance, an impediment, if you fight back, if you resist the psychopath. So all good, all bad. But in psychopathy language, psycho language, all useful and all obstacle. It's splitting all the same. 
that splitting interfere, interferes with object learning and creates a fixation, freezes the uh, object identity. So the psychopath gets stuck. He is unable to integrate the various facets and dimensions and aspects and behaviors and manifestations and changes and transformations and transmutations of an object. It's a very, very immature and infantile way of seeing people. People in the psychopath's world, people are either tools or they're obstacles or they don't exist. People's existence emerges from and comes to the attention and awareness and consciousness of a psychopath only if they are useful or if they are a hindrance, if they are an obstacle on the way to accomplishing a goal. You're either with me or you're against me. You're my friend or my foe. You're with me or you're my enemy. Again, as we can see, this is a kind of extended splitting, a splitting mechanism. And so, in the psychopath's world, there are two groups of people who stand out in sharp relief. They're noticeable. The psychopath notices them. The psychopath pays attention to them, monitors them, supervises them, micromanages them, spies on them. And these people are the tools and the obstacles. All other people, as far as the psychopath is concerned, do not exist. And I don't mean this metaphorically or figuratively. They don't exist literally. A psychopath is incapable of perceiving the existence of people who do not serve him in some way or fight him and resist him in some way. These are the only two groups which uh, kind of gain um, a sense of being in the psychopath's world. Now, this is, a, this is similar to narcissism in pathological narcissism. The narcissist is incapable of perceiving the externality and separateness of other people. But whereas the narcissist is incapable of perceiving anyone's separate existence, as far as a narcissist is concerned, he or she is the only existing object. In other words, it's solipsism. With psychopathy, uh, the psychopath is healthier, let's say, more endowed in this sense. The psychopath is capable of noticing, accepting, embracing, and acting on and in and with the separateness and the externality of people. A psychopath recognizes people as external to him, as separate from him, as agents, people with agency and autonomy, personal autonomy and independence. And the psychopath doesn't resent this, unlike the narcissist who is hell-bent on denying you your personal autonomy and independence and agency, the psychopath doesn't care as long as you don't stand in his way, as long as you don't hinder his efforts, as long as you don't become an obstacle on the way to whatever goal he is pursuing. So, you're a tool. If you collaborate with the psychopath, you're an obstacle. If you stand in the way of the psychopath, you are non-existent otherwise. These are the three categories. And there are transition rules. You, uh, as, a, as a human being, as, a, as an external object, you could transition from being irrelevant and therefore unnoticed and therefore non-existent. You can transition from this status to being a tool or to being an obstacle. If you bring yourself to the psychopath's attention by offering him something useful, by suggesting a collaboration by rewarding him somehow, then you become a tool. You used to be irrelevant. You used to be non-existent. You used to be a penumbral shadow, shadow of a human being, a shade. And now suddenly you erupt into full dimensional life. You erupt into the consciousness of the psychopath as a tool, as an instrument. On the other hand, if you resist the psychopath, if you fight the psychopath, if you criticize, disagree with the psychopath, 
create coalitions against the psychopath. You become an obstacle. Again, you transition from having been irrelevant, having been a, sh a shadow, ever, having been non-existent, having been a non-entity and a non-being, you transition from that to having become an obstacle. Now you're an obstacle. As an obstacle, the psychopath perceives you as you are. He perceives, he fully perceives you as external, separate. He realizes you have your own priorities and dreams and fears and emotions and cognitions and so on and so forth. And the same if you're a tool. Actually, the psychopath studies you meticulously. It's a survey, surveillance kind of <laughs> psychology. He surveils you. He studies you meticulously, spies on you. He accumulates, gathers information and intelligence on you and so on and so forth in order to leverage you somehow or in order to eliminate you. The narcissist never does, does this. He's incapable of doing this because he never perceives you as real while the psychopath does. So the first rule of transition in the psychopath's universe, you could transition from being irrelevant or non-existent to being a tool. You could transition from being irrelevant or non-existent to being an obstacle. You could transition from being a tool to being an obstacle. But you cannot transition from being a tool to being irrelevant, contrary to myths online. <laughs> so, if you used to be the psychopath's instrument, if you used to work with the psychopath, collaborate with the psychopath, reward the psychopath, enhance the psychopath, help the psychopath, assist the psychopath, support the psychopath. If you were in cahoots with the psychopath, in a coalition with the psychopath, if you were part of the entourage of the psychopath, an acolyte, a psychophant, an admirer, you name it, if you were with the psychopath in any context, and if you helped the psychopath attain and obtain his goals, and then you stop or your utility is over, you transition to being an obstacle because this is very frustrating to the psychopath. The cessation, cessation of your fun function, the fact that you're no longer functional, no longer responsive, no longer promote him, no longer help him, no longer um, um, kind of drive him towards the accomplishment of his goals, this frustrates the psychopath. And we know from Dollar's work, we know that frustration leads to aggression. When your utility is over, for your own reasons, or because it's just over, you can't help the psychopath anymore, you become an obstacle because you provoke and you trigger in the psychopath frustration. And then he becomes very aggressive towards you. So actually, there are only two rules of transition. If you used to be irrelevant, you can become an, an instrument or you can become an obstacle. If you used to be an instrument or a tool, you can become an obstacle, but never irrelevant. And you're very likely to provoke aggression. This has to do with something called reversal of effect. In psychoanalytic theory, a reversal of effect is a change in the aim of an instinct into the opposite. So the instinct, for example, regarded you as a love object, and then there's a reversal and you become a hate object. That is reversal of effect. Another example, when you are internally a masochist, you have a masochistic impulse to hurt, to hurt yourself, or more precisely to hurt the self, to hurt, to hurt the ego. And then it is transformed into a sadistic impulse to hurt other people. So you start off as a masochist, you want to hurt yourself, and then there is a reversal of, of effect and you become a sadist and you hurt other people. And psychopaths go through a reversal of effect. When you cease to be a tool or an instrument, there is a reversal of effect. And the psychopath transitions from positive emotional investment, positive cathexis in you. Um, you used to be a love object, for example. So he transitions from this to positive, uh, negative cathexis. You become an enemy, you become demonic, you become hated, 
and the and the psychopath is so frustrated that is the only option is to eliminate you somehow to destroy you to ruin anything i don't know your reputation your financial your financials your your family your your job something it's not revenge it's the need to remove a source of frustration a psychopath cannot countenance frustration because they're so goal oriented they need to accomplish goals because goals guarantee gratification and they're addicted to the pleasure principle they are pleasure driven and they are power driven and frustration takes away the pleasure and takes away the power and leaves them denuded of any reason to exist so they need to destroy you and remove you from the scene and they do this through a reversal of effect obstacles must be eliminated forthwith instruments can be on standby instruments can be deployed instruments can be withdrawn that is up to the psychopath's discretion a little like in the military you know if you're in the reserves or if you're in the regular military if you so a little like in the military the psychopath deploys his battalions deploys his resources at his sole decision making and choice but obstacles trigger the psychopath into destructive violent aggressive behavior anything from a smear campaign to murder essentially so when you lose your utility as an instrument because you have chosen to disengage from the psychopath this exacerbates the frustration because it challenges the psychopath perception as omnipotent all controlling and takes away his power disempowers him when on the other hand you lose your utility as an instrument because you're no longer useful you have lost your access your contacts have died i don't know what you don't have money anymore to give him you are growing old and the sex is not what it used to be you have lost your utility at that point you become a burden and a threat a burden and a threat because you're also a repository of memories of glory's past the psychopath needs to eliminate any record and any trace of failure or potential failure and your transmutation your transformation your transubstantiation into um, an obstacle you used to be a tool now you're an obstacle is unacceptable to the psychopath because it implies that there are processes outside his control that the power is outside himself he is not godlike this is the psychopath's grandiosity now small percentage of psychopaths are also narcissists online experts who claim that all psychopaths are narcissists need to go back to school regardless of their academic degrees only a small portion are also narcissists but it is true that both narcissists and psychopaths are grandiose and whereas the locus of the narcissist's grandiosity can be anything, even victimhood, you know, I'm the ultimate victim, or I'm the ultimate genius, or whatever, the locus of the psychopath's grandiosity has to do usually with power. Power granted to him by money, power granted to him by sex, power. And he cannot countenance and survive instances and reminiscences of disempowerment he cannot cope with the realization that he is not as powerful as he wants to believe that he is and your transition from instrument to obstacle does this to him reminds him of his limitations and incapacity so he needs to eliminate you. accomplishment of goals i mentioned yields gratification it also upholds and buttresses the psychopath's grandiosity but much more than that it's a pleasure whereas healthy people normal people experience pleasure in a variety of ways hundreds of ways the psychopath experiences pleasure only when he has accomplished his goals actually the goals sometimes are not that important it's the accomplishment of the goals the attainment of the goals 
having proven to himself that he is able to transcend all obstacles, the perseverance, the stamina that generate the gratification, the sense of unmitigated power over circumstances, over environments, over other people. And it's the kind of power that is essential power. It's not power that it's, the psychopath doesn't perceive his or her power as external, something that he has acquired. He perceives it as emanating from who he is. The psychopath is power. You know, l'état c'est moi, the state is I, I'm the state. So the psychopath is his own power. In this sense, the psychopath is self-generating. Everything comes from the inside, is innate which is, of course, a godlike quality. The psychopath's addiction to money or to sex or to is all about power. And even the psychopath's addiction to power in many ways is secondary. It's the attaining power, securing power, exercising power is a kind of self-affirmation the gratification is embedded or is the outcome of the psychopath's self-affirmation. So when the psychopath has power, when he exercises power, when power is evident and the outcomes of power are discernible, the psychopath says, everything I think about myself must be true. So power confirms to the psychopath that his self-perception and self-image are correct. And all this emanates from anxiety. Today we know, recent studies have demonstrated and are demonstrating that psychopathy may be a compensatory reaction to anxiety. Exactly like narcissism. Narcissism is a compensatory reaction to shame. Psychopathy is a compensatory, compensatory reaction to insecurity, a sense of lack of safety, dread, angst, anxiety. The psychopath feels that he is on an alien, hostile, menacing planet. And the only way to calm himself down, the only anxiolytic solution, anxiety reducing solution, is to demonstrate to himself how powerful he is. Because if he is infinitely powerful, he is finally safe. He is finally secure. He doesn't need to, to worry. He doesn't need to wake up at night drenched in sweat. He doesn't need all this. Now, the myth that psychopaths are fearless is a myth. They're not fearless. They're actually anxious. It is true, though that the bodies react differently to fear. We don't know whether this is the outcome of some innate hereditary genetic template or whether actually the psychopaths need to cope with threatening, traumatizing, abusive, dangerous environments has caused his brain to rewire and his body to change physiologically. We don't know what preceded what, but it is a fact. The psychopath does not experience his anxiety and does not experience his fear. What he experiences when he is afraid, what he experiences when he is anxious, is a surge of adrenaline, the need to conquer, the need to assert control, the need to, tr to drive towards a goal and to occupy it and to, if necessary, consume it and subsume it, to obliterate it or eradicate it, whatever the case may be, whatever the goal, however the goal is defined, destructive or constructive, it is the attainment of the goal that empowers the psychopath and it is this empowerment that calms him down, reduces his underlying generalized anxiety and he experiences this as gratification. We have, a con we have a concept called object of instinct. Object of instinct in classical psychoanalytic theory 
It's an object which is sought in order to achieve satisfaction. The object could be a person, a real inanimate object, a possession. It could be a behavior, it could be a goal, it could be a narrative, it could be anything. So it's an object that is sought, that is pursued, that is conquered in order to achieve satisfaction. The internal aim, this is called the internal aim. So there's an external aim, which is the object to be taken over, the object to be secured, the object to be actualized and realized. As I said, the object would be a, a project or a plan or an idea or a, a, a behavior or, what, or, or a person or an a possession. It could be anything. Object is simply anything outside the self. So this is the external aim. And when the psychopath acquires this external aim, he achieves the internal aim, which is on the surface gratification and satisfaction, but in reality, a reduction in generalized, all-consuming underlying anxiety. The aim of the instinct in psychoanalytic theory is the activity through which an instinct is gratified, resulting in the release of internal tension, anxiety. So, and, and this is the instinctual aim. This is, this is the mechanism which underlies psychopathy. Psychopath, the psychopath consequently cathects or cathexes, cathex goals. The cathexis is in goals. Cathexis in the, is in the power to obtain goals, actually, to be more precise. Not, not in the goals, but the cathexis is in the power to obtain goals. Because this kind of power proves to the psychopath that he needs not be afraid, he needs not be anxious, he need not be, he need not be wary, he need not be hypervigilant, he need not be, you know, because the world is under control. This hostile, horrible, jungle, Darwinian landscape is under control. This alien, Martian uh, soil is under his feet, he is in charge. So the psychopath cathects, cathects the power that allows him to obtain goals, never people. He never cathects people. What he does with people is known as reification, or in colloquial terms, objectification. Reification is when you treat something outside yourself, could be another person, could be uh, a possession, could be an abstraction, an idea, a concept, could be a formulation, could be a plan, could be a goal. When you treat something outside yourself as if it were an object, a material thing, you reify it. So you take it literally. So reification is a fallacy, of course. And this is the process of object, objectif objectification, converting living, breathing human beings into objects, inanimate objects, via reification. But in the case of the psychopath, reification extends not only to people. The psychopath reifies his goals. He objectifies them. He regards his goals the same way you and I would regard a shining new device. He reifies the power that he accumulates and exercises on the way to obtaining his goal. It becomes an object, again, a shining new device. The, the psychopath covets power. He craves power. He's addicted to power. He salivates over power because power is the only thing that can restore his inner equilibrium, his peace of mind, his homeostasis. It is when he exercises power that he experiences elation, narcissistic elation. Uh, Freud called it oceanic feeling. The merger with a symbolic, atavistic, primordial mother. He mothers himself. The psychopath becomes his own maternal figure, a, safe, a secure base, a safe haven when he acquires power. It's the power is his mother. 
he perceives power as maternal and then it allows him to take on the world in other words to separate and individuate in effect you see beginning you see beginning to see the similarities with the shared fantasy in narcissism and indeed the psychopath develops a shared fantasy with his goals not with people there he is distinct from narcissism, narcissism uh, from the narcissist the narcissist develops a shared fantasy with people people as props people as actors in his shared fantasy but people all the same the psychopath develops a shared fantasy with his goals or much more precisely the psychopath develops a shared fantasy with his power whereas in the narcissist shared fantasy the intimate partner is the maternal figure the new maternal figure in the psychopath shared fantasy power is the maternal figure power is the psychopath's wet dream literally it's incestuous there's an incest dynamic going on I keep saying object 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 let's go back to basics an object when we talk about people an object is the other that is any person or symbolic representation of a person that is not the self and that provokes or triggers behavior or cognitions or affects which are then directed at the object so when you have a human being when you have a person <clears throat> outside of yourself and you recognize that this person is not you you recognize the boundaries I end here and this person begins this person ends here and I begin so when you recognize the externality and separateness of that other person and you realize that this other person is the same as you via the mechanism of empathy when this happens the other person ironically becomes an object and your behaviors object I mean in psychological parlance in psychological lingo when we say object in psychology we mean a person outside yourself and we mean that you recognize this person's externality and separateness you recognize that this person is exactly like you so then we call this kind of person uh, an object <laughs> in psychology which tells you a lot about psychology anyhow at that moment when you recognize the externality and separateness and equality of, of that other person your behavior changes you develop cognitions you develop emotions you develop affects the information about that other person changes you and affects your behavior modifies your behavior and this is what we call object relations we'll come to it in a minute in psychoanalytic theory there's a more expansive definition of object object as I've described now is a common definition in object relations theories but in classical psychoanalytic theory and current psychoanalytic theory object when we use the word object we mean something a lot more expansive object is anything in psychoanalytic theory object is anything person thing part of a body symbol plan id i mean you name it object is anything through which an instinct can achieve its aim of gratification period anything external to you and anything internal to you which grants or guarantees gratification instinctual gratification is an object so in the case of the psychopath this second definition pertains not the first because the psychopath regards everything as an object not only everyone but everything everything the psychopath objectifies everything including his sense of power including himself including other people including plans and and, and uh, goals and objectives and in everything immediately the psychopath immediately converts into an object reifies everything whereas the narcissist reifies and objectifies mostly people 
the psychopath's reification or objectification is out of control. It's totally wild. The psychopath regards everything himself included as some kind of object. That's why psychopaths don't react the way you do to being wounded, physically wounded. They don't react the, the way you do to threats because the psychopath object, has objectified himself. He, he is one step removed. It's a kind of dissociation. The psychopath's tendency to reify and objectify everything, humans, abstracts, concepts, possessions, himself, you name it. This tendency is a kind of defensive dissociation. If the world is so horrible, if it's survival of the fittest, if it's nature uh, red in tooth and claw, you know, if the world is a dystopian uh, kind of environment, uh, to dissociate yourself from the world, to remove yourself from the world is a great idea, actually. And this is what the psychopath does. He cuts himself off the world. He no longer exists by becoming a rock, by becoming a stone. You know, the famous, the famous horror movies and documentaries where psychopaths are described as stone-like or non-human in the inanimate sense. They're, they're not animated. And that's because they have removed themselves from the scene. They're not there. And not only are they not there, there is no self which has been removed. I mean, the psychopaths do possess. I want to be clear. Psychopath, psychopaths do possess a self, a fully constellated and integrated self. The formation of selfhood formation of the self or the ego in psychopathy is much less disrupted than in borderline and in narcissism. And in this sense, psychopathy, ironically, psychopaths, ironically, are much healthier, mentally healthier than narcissists and borderline. But when the psychopath dissociates because he needs to objectify himself, he, he removes even his self from the scene. He ceases to exist, kind of astral, <laughs> astral trip. He, he just is not there. He's not there. And this Im imbues him with a sense of security, safety, enhances his power. So the source of the psychopath's power is, is his invulnerability, impermeability untouchability. Psychopath says, psychopath's message is, you can't do anything to me because I'm not here. And yes, this is very reminiscent of depersonalization and derealization, which are essentially dissociative mechanisms. I've dedicated a video to this. You can watch it. It's taking yourself out of reality. It's telling yourself, this is not happening to me. Depersonalization. And or this is not real. It's just a fantasy. Derealization. The psychopath says, you have no power over me and I have all the power over you because there's nothing you can do to me and I can do everything and anything to you. And you can do nothing to me because I'm not here. My body may be here, but nothing else and nothing much more. So I'm untouchable. I'm impermeable. I'm invulnerable. In short, I'm godlike. There is a direct correlation between the level of dissociation in, in psychopathy and the level of perceived self empowerment. The higher, more pervasive, more profound the dissociation, the more the psychopath feels empowered, the more he feels present, ironically, the more he feels in control and in charge. He is the boss, he is godlike. He determines the fates of everyone and everything around him. You talk to any psychopath and they will describe this out-of-body experience. They will describe that when they were at the height of their power, as they have perceived it, when they were killing someone, 
when they were when they've accomplished a heist or a scam when they were doing something which which flew in the face of social mores and norms and and the law and and broke every rule and and when they were defiant and when they were contumacious rejecting authority and when they were you know gung-ho super men powered whatever at that point they will tell you psychopaths will tell you that they felt they were not there they felt as if they were observing something watching something a movie kind of it's a dissociation power equation in psychopathy object relations in narcissism is mediated through the shared fantasy and the narcissist has internal object relations narcissist object relations with objects is with representations of external objects in his mind so whereas healthy normal people have external object relations they fall in love with someone out there the narcissist has internal object relations he falls in love with a representation of someone out there in his mind the psychopath's object relation is highly complex as i said the psychopath is capable of perceiving the existence the functioning the separateness of external objects unlike the narcissist psychopath's reality testing is not impaired it's intact, while the narcissist's reality testing is shot, is destroyed. In other words, the narcissist is delusional and embedded in a fantasy defense, whereas the psychopath is not. So, the psychopath is capable of perceiving external objects and relating to them if, if they are instruments or obstacles. And so, in principle, the psychopath should be able to maintain object relations he should be able to be responsive to the external existence of objects object relations is an individual's relationship to their entire external world with emphasis on people in psychoanalysis object relations is an individual's relationships to their objects real or imagined persons activities things that function as sources of connection as well as libidinal or aggressive gratification in the case of the psychopath there is a problem there is a problem because the psychopath is fully interactive with and responsive to the external world including people in the external world but his relationship with with people is premised on utility what can people do for him or in which way they endanger and undermine his agenda so this inability to to relate to people except insofar as they fit into a cunning scheme or project or a plan renders the psychopath's object relations very impoverished and one-dimensional and yet whereas the narcissist has object relations only with internal objects and whereas the borderline has object relations only with external objects the psychopath has object relations with external objects having reduced them to their utility to, to a, a pinpoint like entity you remember how we started the lecture Uh, this has to do a lot with object cathexis, the investment of libido or the investment of psychic energy, emotional energy, uh, cognitive energy in objects outside the self. A person, God, ID, activity, plan, goal, they're all outside the self and you invest energy in these things. When you love someone, you invest energy in them. When you have a plan, you pursue it, you invest energy in it. This process is called cathexis. There is a problem with object cathexis in psychopathy, and it underlies and gives rise to the problem in object relations. The psychopath does not cathect the object. He cathects what the object can give him. 
heat affects how the object can promote his agenda. Heat affects the goal. Heat affects the power that he has over the object, over the, the person. So he doesn't affect people. He affects the interaction with people. And much more precisely, he affects his side of the interaction with people. So the psychopath is self protecting The psychopath perceives other people as external, but as one would perceive pawns on a chessboard. The psychopath is emotionally invested in his power over people, on what people can give him, on what people, how they can promote uh, his accomplishments, guarantee them, or how can they obstruct and hinder his progress. He's affected in all this, but not in the people themselves. The same way a chess player is emotionally invested in the game and in winning, or even in the adversary, but the chess player is never emotionally invested in the pieces. In the pieces of chess, he's not emotionally invested in the pawn or the knight or the queen or the king. They're mere instruments and sometimes they're obstacles. You could perceive, you could visualize, or you could conceptualize and definitely verbalize the psychopath's internal world as an infinite, infinite chess game where all people are pieces on a board. That would be getting very close to the psychology of the psychopath. The psychopath uh, has a problem with people but not the same problem that a narcissist or a borderline has. If we want to delve deeper and understand why psychopaths end up the way they do, something, an exploration which I did with narcissists and with borderlines, I will give you a hint because I'll dedicate a video to it much further down the road, but I will give you a hint. But before I give you this hint, we need to define a concept known as object constancy. In object relations theory, an object constancy is an infantile feature, feature of infancy, early childhood. It is the ability of the infant to maintain an attachment, attachment that is relatively independent of gratification or frustration based on a cognitive capacity to conceive of a mother who exists when she is out of sight and a mother who has positive attributes even when she is frustrating, rejecting and unsatisfying. In other words, object constancy, object constancy relies on two psychological processes, two psychological dynamics the ability to retain an image of a person who is not physically present mother left the room but she's still in my head says the infant i can still see her in my mind's eye and the second mechanism or process or dynamic is the ability to integrate the negative and positive features of a person into a single unified vision in other words to counter or countermand splitting. When you put these two together, you get object constancy. The infant becomes attached to the mother herself rather than, her, the, rather than to her tension reducing uh, ministrations. Or, so he, he gets attached to the mother, not to the functions of the mother. He gets attached to mother, not to what mother does for, him, for the child for the infant. The infant gets attached to mother, not to how she comports or herself or behaves. So the mother comes to exist continuously for the infant, not only when the infant needs her, not only when she satisfies the infant's needs, not only when she frustrates the infant. She is there, a continuous presence. It is an investment by the infant in a specific libidinal object. And this also means that mother becomes unique. She is no longer interchangeable with someone else. The infant has fixated her. The infant has created 
a fixed image of her, an internal object, an imago, an introject of her, in the infant's mind, in his or her mind. And so from, the, from that moment on, she is recognizable. She cannot be confused or conflated with anyone else. So this is object constancy. And remember this when we discuss psychopathy. There is also a concept of object loss. In psychoanalytic theory, the actual loss of a person who served as a good object is known as object loss. A good mother, for example, or good enough mother. The child is afraid, afraid to lose her. So what the child does, he introjects her. He creates a snapshot of her, an internal object, a photograph of her, and he internalizes it. He puts this in his or her mind. From that moment on, the infant has a representation of the good object in his or her mind. And this reduces the separation anxiety. The anxiety about the possible loss of a good object begins with panic. The infant panics about being separated, being abandoned, being rejected. It's known clinically as separation insecurity. So what's the solution? You make a photograph of mommy, you place it in your mind and you're safe because mommy now is always there. Adult grief and mourning are examples of object loss and separation anxiety. Adult grief and mourning trigger infantile separation anxiety and infantile object loss anxiety in infancy and childhood. And this complicates, of course, the grief reaction. Okay, object constancy, object loss. If you have difficulty to retain this information in your head, go back. Listen to it again, make notes, be good students, all right? And I will uh, now discuss object permanence. In the wake of all these concepts, we put them together and I'll attempt to explain the dynamics inside the psychopath's mind. But we need to get acquainted with these concepts, otherwise uh, whatever it is that I have to say will sound nonsensical. Uh, it usually sounds nonsensical, but <laughs> I'm trying to reduce this. Okay, Shoshanim, object permanence. Object permanence was first described by Jean Piaget, the eminent child psychologist. I still haven't decided who was number one child psychologist. Winnicott, Piaget, Mahler, and so on. I think Piaget is a claim. So object permanence is the knowledge of the continued existence of objects, even when they are not directly perceived, even when they are not physically present. According to Jean Piaget, object permanence develops gradually in infants during what he called the sensory motor stage of cognitive development. And there are milestones that indicate the acquisition of object permanence. Uh, Piaget was very, like Mahler, Piaget was, was very meticulous in documenting his observations of children. And so he broke it down to stages. The same way Ericsson broke down life, the lifespan into stages, Piaget did the same with childhood. He said that if we observe children, we can see the moment or the time or the period when they begin to develop object permanence. Um, when the child reaches for and retrieves a covered object, the object is covered, but the child knows that under the cover, there's an object. It's an example of object permanence. And this happens between ages 8 and 12 months. Or when a child retrieves an object at location B, even though it was previously hidden several times in location A. Again, the same time frame, 8 to 12 months. So the child can conceptualize that the object is the same, never mind that the location has changed. This is known, by the way, as the A, not B task. Or when the child removes a series of covers to retrieve an object, even though the infant only witnessed the object being hidden under the outermost cover. This is known as invisible displacement. It happens usually between the ages of 18 and 24 months. So non -re uh, these are the reaching tasks. When the child reaches out to an object, even though 
there's no hint of the object physical presence. It's covered or relocated or something, dislocated. Now, more recent research using non-reaching tasks suggests that infants display some knowledge of object permanence at a much earlier stage than suggested by Piaget. And this sits well with the work of Fairbairn about ego. Fairbairn and Melanie Klein claim the children are born with an ego. They don't develop it, they don't constellate or integrate it, but they're born with it. Okay, I will not get to go into it right now. Uh, so, now that we've become acquainted with object constancy and with object permanence and with object loss, remember, let's go back to the psychopath. Remember that psychopaths are probably born. There's a strong hereditary component in psychopathy, genetic component. There are brain abnormalities in psychopathy, pronounced brain abnormalities, amygdala, gray matter, you name it. And there is a difference between the physiological reactions of the psychopath's body and the physiological reaction of a normal body. For example, psychopaths sweat much less. Their pupils don't dilate when they're exposed to horror, pictures of horror, photographs of horror, and so on. So we know the psychopaths are different, <laughs> even kind of a species unto their own, an alien species. But never forget that every genetic and hereditary predisposition is triggered by the environment. You could be born for a predisposition for narcissism, but it would remain, remain dormant and latent if the environment is loving and compassionate and containing and holding. Psychopaths grow up in abusive, traumatizing, violent, aggressive, shocking, terrifying, terrorizing families. That has been proven in umpteen studies. The incidence and prevalence of adverse childhood experiences among psychopaths is much higher by multiples than the incidence of prevalence of such bad experiences among more normal or healthy people. The psychopaths have been exposed to a terrible childhood in dysfunctional families. Anything from substance and drug abuse to, to beatings to, I mean, you name it. So psychopaths were not exposed to a good object Psychopaths were not exposed to loving parents, holding parents, understanding and accepting parents. They were exposed to animals. They were exposed to bestial criminals. They were exposed to the most horrific torture. And so they did not have a good object outside. They didn't have a mother or a father they could consider to be good objects. And because they had only a bad external bad object, they never experience, experience object loss. I mean, if your father or your mother keeps beating you up to pulp, almost killing you in the process day in and day out, you're not likely to regard them as good objects and you're not likely to grieve if they were to die. You're not likely to experience the terror or the anxiety of object loss. And you're not likely to feel the need to interject them why would you interject an abusive, traumatizing mother, for example? You wouldn't. I mean, there's another process known as a prime, uh, the primitive superego, the internalization of a bad, a bad object. That is an unconscious process. But classical interjection fails in psychopathy. Because classical interjection fails, psychopaths have no object constancy. And that is similar to narcissists. Both psychopaths and narcissists have been exposed to horrendous parenting, to dead mothers, to evil parents. And so both of them did not experience object loss and both of them failed to interject in, in, one, in some ways. So like the narcissist, the psychopath has no object constancy. But the psychopath also doesn't have introject constancy because of the failure to interject. So the psychopath 
is a combination of narcissist and borderline. You remember the narcissist has object, object inconstancy and introject constancy. The borderline has object constancy and introject inconstancy. The psychopath has object inconstancy and introject inconstancy. So the psychopath is unable to relate to you not only when you are out there as external objects, he is unable to relate even to internal objects that represent you in his mind because he doesn't form them, he doesn't create them. His reality testing is intact. So he is able to tell that you are out there. He is able to perceive and recognize and accept your externality and separateness, but there is no emotional resonance to it. It's as if he... It's as if this were some kind of objective knowledge. I don't know, the distance to the sun is 150 million miles or kilometers, whatever it is. So, you know, okay, so what? There's a so what thing with psychopaths. You're out there, you're external, you're separate. You have wishes, you have dreams, you have fantasies, you have hopes, you are, you're afraid, you have cognitions, emotions, so what? And there is no internal object inside the psychopath with which the psychopath could continue the interaction or which the psychopath could use to try to understand you out there. No, nothing. You are there, you're out there, so what? And you're not in here, so what? And you're so what? That's a so what attitude. Whereas the narcissist internalizes you and continues to interact with the internal object. So at least there's a tenuous connection to you somehow. Maybe not to you, but to your representation in the narcissist's mind, to the memory of you in the narcissist's mind, to this snapshot, a moment in time, frozen. But at least this. The same with the borderline. She cannot maintain an internal object in her mind, which represents you, but when you're there, she's all over you. She's intensely interacting. The psychopath is like a totally disinterested, bored, observer you're out there okay you're not in here okay who cares why would i waste my time energy emotions on this i have better things to do you you do exist out there but this existence doesn't resonate with the psychopath it doesn't provoke in him any emotional reactions cognitions nothing it's as if you did not exist it's same like knowing that um Atoms are comprised of neutrons. I mean, the nucleus of atoms is comprised of neutrons and protons. So, okay, so you know they are out there, but do they have any impact on you in any way, shape or form? No, this knowledge has zero impact on you. The knowledge of your existence has zero impact on the psychopath. I think the distinguishing feature of psychopathy is extreme apathy, extreme indifference, bordering on uh, affective paralysis, flat affect, flat attachment, flat everything. The psychopath is a reified flat line. In this sense, he's dead. He's totally dead, externally and internally. Whereas in the narcissist, there are still some dynamics going on. In the borderline, there's drama. Is with a psychopath, there is just the dead stare of a dead fish. And it's a fish, the dead stare of a dead shark. And it's a shark who is after your blood. Because as far as the psychopath is concerned, your externality, your external reality is exactly like blood in the water for a shark. I hope I succeeded to capture and to convey some of this <laughs> utterly surreal um, existence, experience. Another problem with psychopaths is known as object of consciousness issue. Object of consciousness is a, a clinical term, a concept. That perceived object is distinct from the perceiver. The separation of observer and observed is a contentious issue in philosophy. And there are some philosophies, philosophical schools, like phenomenology, which contest this. They say this distinction, this 
chasm, this breaking of the world, the universe, breaking of the universe into observed and observer is artificial. And new develop, I mean, developments in quantum mechanics 100 years ago tended to somehow substantiate this perception that observer, observer and observed are one and so on and so forth. But in psychology, we do make the distinction between the perceived object and the perceiver. The distinction between the perceived uh, object and the perceiver is not illusory. This is not Buddhism. This is not Vedanta philosophy. You know, we do make this distinction in psychology. And we say that object of consciousness is anything of which the mind is conscious, including perceptions, mental images, internal objects, external objects, emotions. Anything the mind becomes aware of is an object of consciousness. And it involves an observing eye. Someone is doing the observing, some ego, uh, some eye, some call it as you wish, but there is an observer, definitely. And this is the observer is the subject of consciousness. It's subjective. This observing ego, observing I, this is the subject. This is the subject, and the subject observes the object. This is how we perceive. Of course, with the psychopath, there is a problem here. Because of the aforementioned issue with issues with object constancy and introject constancy, there is an inability to maintain the process of observation based on this separation between observer and observed. Again, don't confuse this with the ability to externalize. The, the psychopath recognizes your externality, but this is just a fact. It's just a fact, something taken out of Wikipedia. The sun exists and you exist. Okay, existence, you know? It doesn't resonate with the psychopath. It doesn't change the psychopath in any way, emotionally, cognitively, affectively, behaviorally. There's no change. And because you don't change the psychopath, for all practical purposes, you don't exist. And so the psychopath has difficulty to distinguish the process of observation from the process of occupation or the process of acquisition, or the process of overpowering, or the process of conquering. The only way the psychopath observes you as an object of consciousness is when he appropriates you, annexes you, takes over you, usually in a hostile manner, makes what you, what's yours is. So it is the process of acquisition the, this interaction of essentially merger and fusion by force, coerced merger and fusion, that brings your external existence to the psychopath's attention and awareness. So the psychopath is actually accepts your externality and separateness as challenges, as triggers, they provoke in him the need to eliminate you. Either eliminate you via incorporation, by becoming one with you, or taking over you, or eliminate you by killing you, destroying you. In the psychopath's world, eradication, obliteration, destruction are the only modes of communicating with reality, you included, because they are the only ones which guarantee safety and security in a hostile, dangerous, menacing world. And because the psychopath doesn't have object constancy and doesn't have introject constancy, he has no problem, moral or otherwise, to destroy you, or to assimilate you, or to consume you, or to obliterate you. Because by doing this to you, he is not uh, reverting from object constancy to object inconstancy. He is, it doesn't trigger in him any sense of loss, any anxiety, any fear. 
And also, it doesn't change the internal balance and furniture in his mind. You don't exist in his mind. There's no interject there. The narcissist, when he devalues you and discards you, this has a massive impact on the narcissist because it transforms the internal object into a persecutory object, into an enemy. This is not the case with the psychopath. There's no internal object there. Well, no meaningful or stable internal object. So using you and getting rid of you, this is done as an afterthought off-handedly. Um, it's part of a, of a scheme, part of a plan, part of an agenda. You, you, just, you just happen to be there. You're collateral damage, so to speak. You're faceless. You're not humanized, you're dehumanized. And remember the metaphor or the simile of the chessboard. You're just being moved on the, on the board. The self, there's been, there is a, a theory about the, the function of the, the functions of the self and, and uh, so on and so forth. It was first proposed by William James. It's one of my favorites. I mentioned it before in some of the, in some, a few of my videos. So William James said that there are various kinds of functions of the self. There is the self as the observer, the self that has access to conscious experience and knowledge, including knowledge of the self. William James contrasted this with the self as known, and it is synonymous with the nominative self, the I. And he said that the self as known is the self that is known through reflection. It's very similar to the empirical self. It contrasts with the self as observer or knower, and it's synonymous with the me. So we're beginning to see the structure. There's a self as known. I know my, myself. I know me. There's a self as an observer. I'm observing others. I'm observing also myself. Okay? The nominative self is the self as knower of the self rather than the self so known. In the psychology of William James, the nominative self or the I is contrasted with the empirical self or the me, the self that is known by the self rather than the self as knower. So there's one self as the self who knows and one self as the self who is known by the self who knows. In the psychology of William James, the empirical self is held to consist of the material self. Everything material that can be seen as belonging to the self, the social self, the self as perceived by others, and the spiritual self, the self that is closest to one's core subjective experience of oneself. So the empirical self, the me, is not the nominative, nominative self, the I, the observer. Now the social self, are, this is a, a combination or compilation of aspects of one's identity or self-concept that are important to or influenced by interpersonal relationships and the reactions to other people. So the, the social self also includes characteristic behaviors in social, social situations and the persona, the mask, the facade that an individual exhibits when they are in contact with other people as contrasted with their real self. Self as agent is a self that has goals plans and control over voluntary actions. Gordon Allport and others considered this term, self as agent, to be similar in meaning to the I or the nominative self, the self-observer. So the aspect of the self that has agency, the aspect of the self that plays a role in a psychic process or in anything, in goal accomplishment, um, is closer to the me. To the empirical self. Okay, why did I mention all this? Because the psychopath doesn't have a self as an observer. He doesn't have the self as an observer. He 
because he has no internal object or no capacity to introject. It introjects these internal objects always include a representation of the self. They include a representation of an external object of someone out there combined with a representation of the self. When you don't have introjects or the introjection process is disrupted, there is a problem with the perception of the self. And this, of course, disrupts the ability to observe oneself. So psychopaths are not self-aware. And much more importantly, it destroys the capacity to develop a social self. So psychopaths are not influenced by interpersonal relationships, by reactions of other people. They are divorced. They are, as I said, impervious, impenetrable, untouchable. You could say anything to them. You can punish them. You can. They are unchanged, immutable, like a stone. Because they don't have this rich internal world that even the narcissist has. Internally, it's a wasteland. There are no internal objects here. I mean, of course there are internal objects, but they're not like the kind of internal objects that we usually discuss when we discuss pathologies of the self. There is nothing there except an extremely primitive self, nuclear self, uh, that strives for mastery and control of the environment because it catastrophizes and anticipates the worst and regards other people as tools, instruments or obstacles in a chess game that never ends where the adversary is the devil himself. 